At this time, my father is out, but he is on parole. And there used to be an airline called Pan Am. So I booked a flight on Pan Am. I think it was, I don't think it was. It was Detroit, Miami, Miami to the islands. But this time, the clerk at Pan Am doesn't write junior. I'm a junior, right? My father's Courtney Brown, I'm Courtney Brown Jr. She doesn't put junior on my ticket. Through the computer, they think it's my father trying to leave the country. So, as I'm waiting on my connecting flight down to Miami, I notice I'm at the airport restaurant, I notice these four guys like eyeballing me. And I'm thinking to myself, the fuck's up with them? But, you know, I guess I got a little bit overconfident. I did the run three or four times already and never had any issues. It um, didn't look like we were hot. So I, I, I look at them and they're looking at me. Um, I get ready to board my flight. I always like to be the last one on the flight. I get on the plane and as soon, as soon as I get on the plane and, and sit in my seat, I see the same four guys who I saw staring at me in the restaurant get on the plane and I'm thinking to myself, oh, this ain't a good look. But they don't immediately come towards me, they go into the pilot's cockpit. Pilot gets on the PA system and says, hey, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for boarding, Pan Am flight, blah, 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 blah. There's going to be a slight delay, no problem. So I'm thinking to myself, ah, oh, this is not a good look. So all four of them come out of the cockpit, two stay at the cockpit door, and two of them I see making a beeline to me. They get to my seat, they say, Courtney Brown? I say, yeah. They pull out their badges, they say, DEA, please come off to get off the plane with us, grab your bags. Long story short, I get off the plane, they're like, all right, uh, can you please open your bags? What are you, what are you doing? I go through the, you know, you got a warrant? They're like, no, I don't have a warrant, but you need to open your bags and let us see what's going on inside, you know, what you got in there. And I go through, you know, I've been schooled on this. I'm like, I'm not opening up my bags if you guys don't have a warrant. About five minutes later, this white guy pulls up, golf shirt, he's driving the golf cart thing, right? Like you'd see at the golf course. He talks to the DEA for a minute. He says, hey, Mr. Brown, he shows me his credentials. I'm agent so-and-so, U.S. Customs. Here's the situation, young man. You either show us what's inside the bag or I just take it from you. Your choice. He said, I'm, I'm U.S. Customs, I don't need a warrant. You're at an international airport. I believe there's something nefarious going on. If you don't give me your bag or show me what's inside it, I will just take it from you. Well, at that point, the gig is up. I'm like, all right, Mr. Customs, um, where do you want to do this at? He says, come with us. Downstairs in the basement of Miami, Miami International Airport is very nice facilities for people, money launderers and people of, of the sort like that. And they take them to this very nice room and facility in the basement of Miami International, open up the bags, sort through the clothes. Now the money has been sorted. And you know, 90,000 sounds like a lot of money, but when it's all in $100 bills, it doesn't really take up, I mean, you can conceal $90,000 very easily in $100 bills. But eventually they're going through every piece of the luggage and they, they come across the money. What's this all about? I say, look, my family's thinking about getting involved in the seafood business. I'm going down to the islands to make a deal to buy some lobsters. Yeah, 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 yeah. Then they go through the scare tactics. We know who you are, your whole family's being arrested as we speak. There's a whole conspiracy where the gig is up. You know, you might as well tell us what's going on. The back and forth. I don't know what you guys are talking about, man. I'm going to the islands to buy some lobsters. Uh, so finally, they get all the money spread out on the table. Then another customs agent and another bigger shot in the DEA come in. And you gotta know right now, I'm like 22 and I am just dying inside. Cause this is where the shit's not fun anymore. This is not the part of the game where you're at the strip club, you know, th uh, throwing away money. This ain't the nightclubs buying crystal bottles. This is the part of the work that gets real because you're like, there is a great probability that I'm gonna be on my way to jail. <laughs> so, um, I hear though, I overhear the conversation and they go, does he look like he's 44 years old? And then it hits me. 
they think I'm my father. And I hear the conversation, they think I can't hear him, but I can hear him, he said, that's not him, that's his son. He didn't do anything wrong and he's not on parole, he can leave the country. So then they come back and they change their tune and they're like, look, you tell you, you know, we know what you and your father are up to. I don't like, I don't know what you're talking about. They count out the money. They have me sign some tax papers, blah, blah, blah. And then there's three agents now left in the room. Each agent, so it's, it's each agent counts out $3,000, which is 9,000 total. They pocket the three and as they're as they're stealing my money, they're telling me how they're gonna buy their wife a coat or buy their wife a ring and welcome to Miami and this is the real Miami Vice. They each take the 3,000, each agent pockets 3,000 of the money. They tell me to pack up the other 81. I sign some papers. Then they tell me, um, you want us to rebook you another flight to the islands because you've missed your flight. And I'm like, nah, I'm straight. You guys have kind of ruined my appetite for traveling. And they let me go. Crazy part was, I guess, you know, these guys, are, they know what they're doing. So what am I gonna do once they let me go? This is back in the day. I'm gonna go to the payphone. I'm gonna call my people and I'm gonna tell them what happened. Then I'm gonna get in the first thing smoking out of the airport. They let me go. I go to the air, I go to the payphone, call home. They already know that I didn't get off the plane in the island. So they've already surmised that, you know, I got, I got pinched. I hop in a cab, tell them to take me down to downtown Miami, but something told me not to go to my normal hotel. So I just told them, like, take me to a Holiday Inn. The cab I got in was the DEA because when I get out the cab, I go inside the hotel and I'm looked back out the door. They leave the cab, the cab driver gets out, an unmarked car comes, cab driver hops out the car. So they, they had played their cards right. Um, but I didn't go to where I was actually gonna be staying for the night. I stayed at the other hotel for a minute, go to the room. They made arrangements. They sent some people to come pick up the money. Um, and of course that changed my life because um, <laughs> I couldn't do that trip to, um, to the islands anymore because I had been compromised, to quote Mr. B. So we had to move the money payment operation to New York City, which ended up leading me to living in New York for like the next 10 years. Yeah, we were, we were, we were uptown, I think like 143rd and Broadway. My people were coming to town. And um, my man peeped this Puerto Rican kid kind of looking like he was running for somebody. And... Uh, then we looked, it was like a, a clothing store and a little jeweler. And there's this Hasidic, you know, with the long beard and the beanie. And um, my man cuts into the Puerto Rican who's running, the Puerto Rican guy who's running in and out of the store. And he likes, so what, what I mean, is it happening? What, what's happening? For real, for real, huh? you know? And my man happens to have one of those personalities where you're like, he the real deal. He like, you know, let's get to it, man. You know, I ain't the police, you, you, you can, you know what it is, and I'm uptown, I'm up here to find somebody. And my man introduces him to the Hasidic. They chopped it up for like 20 minutes. He comes back to the car, grabs the dough, goes in, comes back out with like two and a half bricks. Yeah, everybody's in it, man. This thing is global, it's cross-cultural, it's cross-religion. Um, it's just business, it's part of, American, it's part of the American economy. The spots, the Dominican spots, they would um, give away a tenth to every customer. You might be at the joint and somebody's buying a 20 or a 50, and then you can come in there and spend 10,000. Same guy serve you. Literally, they got barrels. They got like 40 bricks just sitting at the table. Now the shit is well secure because everybody's getting pat down and you know they got a small arsenal. But it just didn't matter. It was truly a Sam's Club of cocaine and that wasn't the only spot like that um and then there were some brothers man i mean i remember this other this crew on 145th and um amsterdam at the chinese restaurant they were making so much bread on the weekends they rented out half the chinese would sell let them run half the restaurant so there, there's like a sit down chinese restaurant going on and then the brothers got like the other half selling their bottles right so they would like sell a bottle of powder, a bottle of fish scale crack, like 10 bucks. But it was like a half a gram for like $10. So that's like what, $20? $20 a gram? 
It was crazy. It was just crazy. 